All right. Good evening, everyone. Paul Marie. Welcome this evening to our first technical presentation hosted by CSOC Emerging Structural Engineers Network. The Emerging Structural Engineers Network was just launched in February uh, with our launch in Auckland and now Christchurch and Wellington following up. The intention of our Emerging Structural Engineers Network is of, to aid the transition between university student to proficient industry engineer by providing further learning and support specific to structural design. The Emerging Structural Engineers Network technical presentation topics are guided by the framework of the CSOC Body of Knowledge document, which is now available on the CSOC website. This document defines the core skills and knowledge that a chartered professional engineer is expected to have in order to be competent. So for all of those of us aiming to be chartered, this is a great opportunity to gain some further learning. And all, for all of those that are, are proficient and out there being chartered and doing amazing work, this is a great opportunity to just check in with those skills and learn something perhaps you didn't know before. It is therefore with great respect and excitement that I introduce Andrew Thompson to speak tonight. Andrew is the Technical Director at Homes Consulting in Auckland, where he's worked on a spectrum of projects covering both new design and assessment of seismic buildings. Complex analysis and careful detailing, and also has provided patient and sound guidance to many young and senior engineers. Please join me in welcoming Andrew Thompson tonight. Thank you, Charlotte. So, the topic today, or the purpose of today's talk, is um, for all the different types of talks and seminars and content that um, the ESA group will um, aim to deliver. There's a range of different types. Um, this is sort of a mix of things, really. It's, it's, a, it's a case example. It's a, um, it uses the commercial bay development in a particular area within that project. Um, just to go through a few aspects of, of concrete behaviour, some reflections on, on that behaviour and actually applying that into, a, into a, the design. So it's a little bit scattered. There's a, a few other examples um, which are slotted in along the way. Um, it's great to see so many faces here. I suspect that for a few of you it'll be um, not too much more than revision, but at the very least it'll be um, a, a good example of, of sharing our work. So the commercial bay development um, I'm guessing a, most of you have seen the progress down at the bottom of town. So it comprises, um, depending on how you count, about seven buildings. Um, there's a basement, a three-storey basement underneath most of the site. There's a commercial tower in the back corner. Uh, there's a spattering of other smaller retail buildings. And there's a, a tunnel, so the central rail link, which comes out of Bredemart and then turns the corner and heads up Albert Street, um, goes right through the middle of the site. Um, so, as well as controlling the set out of the tower to sneak a corner column um, right down the, the, the middle of the twin boxes before they uh, turn into a, a single box and, and head up Albert Street, it also, of course, has some impacts on how we deal with um, the support of the, the other smaller concrete and steel buildings um, which sit on top of that. So, uh, the first one we'll focus on is, is what we call Building 3. It's this blue one. It's uh, essentially two suspended concrete floors above the transfer level or above the ground level, um, uh, the entrance level off uh, Queen Street. That building um, is a relatively simple structure. Um, most of the details in the cladding. This is a view from the bottom of Queen Street looking back towards the, the development. Two-way moment-resistant concrete frames, nominally ductile. And you can see a little, see a little snip there of, of the transfer structure underneath, um, which props up the corner of that as it extends over the rail tunnel. Right adjacent that, or nestled between Building Three and the Zurich, the existing uh, mid-rise building on the on the site, um, there's a smaller steel building. This is quite a fun little building. It's a um, elastically designed, quite an architectural piece. Um, it's got quite a long cantilevered section of. Um, of what looks like building, but it's actually really just a, um, a roof and a, and a glazed 
um, a glazed facade. And right down between the two, there's a laneway that goes through the whole site, separating those buildings, which also has glazing over the top of that. So um, it's a pretty lightweight structure, and in fact, it hasn't got a particularly large floor plate. Um, and that one also sits over the CRL tunnel as well. So this is a plan view of the tunnels. They come out of Britomart as um, a couple of boxes, and then as you go around towards Albert Street, they merge into, into um, one box with a central divider. So it's really important for avoiding transmission of vibration up into the tower that these are separated from the structure. So they don't actually have any uh, structural connection. Even the slab between which are columns that you'll see in the next few slides which come down, there is a, there is a separation there. And so the only connection is, is via the east coast bays um, underneath. This is, a, this is a view of what we call level three, which is actually the first suspended level below grade level as you enter the, um, the site off, off Queen Street, off Lower Queen Street. And that's where the transfer occurs. So this is the, what we call the CRL lid. So not, not only do we have to have some separated box, um, box culverts, essentially box tunnels, um, but we also have to provide some acoustic and um, vibration insulation just by way of a lot of mass. So we have a minimum thickness of 400 millimeters of concrete which wraps around um, and encases those tunnels. And so, the, the lid, um, which is what the transfer beams for the upper superstructure are located on, is, is, a, um, is a double T flooring system with 350 mils of topping, so, um, so quite a thick, heavy slab as well. This again is, is a section in, in 3D just showing how those um, tunnels um, move through underneath, un underneath the CRL lid and the transfer structure. So down at this end, there's actually a reasonable um, bit of clearance between the tunnels and the transfer beams. But of course, as the tunnels go around the corner, they do raise up, they, the grade increases slightly. And so we do get to the point where we're a little bit squeezed for height in the transfer beams. And I think um, it's fair to say it, it would have been nicer if they had been a little bit deeper. Um, they're probably a little bit shallower than they, they could have been. Um, but, and you'll see some examples of the impacts of that uh, a bit later on. So this just cuts a couple of sections as we move through from the, the diaphragm wall, um, which closes off the basement on the eastern side at Lower Queen Street. Um, that same view is, is the last slide. And then as we move in, um, you can see as the, as the tunnels work around the corner, the, the transfer beams just follow that. They've got a couple of central supports and they're supported by big pilasters on the side walls of the, um, of the tunnel. As we go a bit further on down, um, you can see that building three, the concrete structure actually ends up going off the edge. We're still supporting the back end of um, building four and five, which is the steel structure. And then we start to pick up some concrete structure, which is the skirt of the tower, which is a, a structure which is attached to uh, the steel framed commercial tower and is tied back to it, um, but has concrete structure for gravity support. As we go right around the corner, we end up at the northern elevation of the commercial tower. And at that point, there's a significant transfer for the tower structure as well, um, both to get the gravity loads out of some of the internal columns um, in a slightly odd and complicated arrangement of steel transfer trusses. But there's also, in effect, a, a portal frame wall, uh, which helps to take that base share out of the externally braced frame and get that down to the point where it's, it's taken out and transferred into the East Coast Bays at the bottom of the basement, um, at the bottom of the tunnels. So as well as dealing with that, that also picks up a bunch of the transfer beams at that far end. And it's a, a picture of a work in progress. Um, so. Um, not complete yet, um, but part way through tying up some of the reinforcing in that um, in this in this wall here. So with that context, and I hadn't wanted to spend too much time um, talking about the seismic side of things because um, I think that sometimes um, the the focus in New Zealand being a high seismic zone um, on the on the seismic side of things is, is sometimes a necessary but an unwanted distraction because there's a lot of other aspects of concrete behaviour which are hugely important. Um, 
in terms of the serviceability of structures, the durability of structures, the way that they perform day to day. And um, I think it can be easy sometimes to, to overlook some aspects of, of, of design which are, which are hugely important to how the structure will actually be used and whether it will perform. But you can't really go past transfer structures without um, you know, talking about <coughs> seismic loads. Um, and so vertical accelerations are considered. Um, in our standards, we have the discretion to decide whether or not we think a particular element is, um, is likely to be sensitive to vertical accelerations. It's a very tricky topic. There's, um, there's a, a rapidly improving understanding of the actual, you know, the, the demand side of the equation in terms of quantifying vertical design actions. There's still, I think, a lot of work to be done on the capacity side in terms of the response to vertical accelerations um, and um, the energy content in vertical accelerations and, and whether they're actually truly damaging. But vertical transfer, or sorry, horizontal transfer structures are, are one element where um, it's, uh, you're dealing with a huge amount of mass and you certainly want to play on the safe side of things and so vertical accelerations absolutely need to be included. The, um, the design process uses one and a half times those actions from the ultimate limit state. Um, that comes out of some CSOC guidance. It's not a codified requirement, but um, it is, I think you would say, industry, industry practice. And those demands have increased lately. And so as a learning from the Christchurch earthquake, it was found that um, even though for distant earthquakes, which are distant to their source, you know, vertical accelerations perhaps weren't so prominent, if earthquakes are close, then those vertical accelerations can be um, quite significant. And so a decision was made that we should modify our spectrum and, and give a little bit of an uplift. They're measured in terms of vertical to horizontal ratios. They had been set at 0.7 times the horizontal spectrum, but what our new um, spectrum does is, is lift that up to ratios of between 0.9 and 1.5. And, and so whilst this um, didn't govern the design in this case, it was a de design which is governed by gravity, um, recall, of course, that we did actually design using the old version of the standard because not only is it not cited now, but it wasn't actually released at the time that this um, project was designed and, and the basement work consented. But certainly when you get down to the likes of Wellington, particularly in the soft soil sites, um, the accelerations that you're being asked to deal with um, are truly enormous. And so it's something that will, um, will certainly um, yeah, add a few ch challenges to similar sorts of arrangements in other parts of the country. Along with that, we've got our lateral loading. Again, one and a half times our ULS actions for transfer structures. They're just too important um, to, uh, to, to, to treat lightly and not to build in some specific robustness um, without the guarantee of some of the other protections that we have in our standards for normal buildings. Um, the preference, though, is to use capacity-derived actions. And so despite um, the building not being um, fully capacity designed, it's only two suspended stories, um, we, we did use those actions for, for the the design of this transfer structure. Um, this, this guide is, um, of course, superseded in part. Um, it was a document which was put together shortly after the Canterbury earthquakes to collect together a whole range of learnings so that engineers could use them and apply them confidently in the rebuild. But as was always the plan, a lot of that's now been picked up in Amendment 3 to the Concrete Structure Standard as well as Amendment 1 to the Loading Standard. So this is what we have on our, our own version of the document that we keep. Um, but there's still plenty, part, plenty of parts of this, of this document which are absolutely relevant. Um, and the comments on transfer structures are, are one of those areas. So departing from the seismic loading side of things, um, it would, I thought it would be good to just have a bit of a discussion or, a, or, or put some thought behind what actually makes a deep beam. You know, these beams are, are large, but by the, the definition that we have in our concrete standard, a deep beam is actually one where, because of its size and because of where the actions have applied and because of its aspect ratio, rather than having a conventional truss shear mechanism, you instead can develop struts which form between the top of a column or, top of an, or the top of the beam with an applied load and the support reaction. And so they behave in quite a different way to a slender beam. This diagram, I think, is, is a fantastic one. It shows a lot of the different types of shear force that you can see in, in beams, not only deep beams. It shows a deep beam type arrangement on the left um, where struts are forming directly to supports. 
and it shows a more slender beam example on the right where shear reinforcing is used in a more conventional way to, to pick up those, those shears and that truss mechanism and, and transfer that out. And it also shows an example in the middle of a very shallow strut. Um, and if you're not too careful, then if those struts are too shallow, then you do end up effectively having that crack flatten out and extend. Um, and that's the point where clearly um, shear reinforcing is required and treating it as a strut and tie solution with a strut that shallow just doesn't work. So to understand the difference in the behavior between um, all those different types of, 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 of shear, I think this paper is excellent. It's, um, it's one of those ones which um, you could, if you wanted to find it, you'd probably look at the person next to you and they'll say, oh, it's sitting on the man mantelpiece next to the, the Paulet um, joint paper or the um, ninth mallet millimeter. It's, it's, one of the, it's one of the fantastic um, papers which describes the, a, a huge improvement that was made in our understanding of how concrete elements perform in shear. Over 100 of these, of these panel elements were tested um, by Michael Collins and his team um, based at the University of, um, of Toronto, if I've got that right. And the idea was to apply pure shears as well as applying axial forces to, to, to membranes, to reinforce concrete membranes, to try and understand their behavior a little bit better. So it's very, very clever. It's also very, very complicated. It uses more circle of stress to try and figure out what the angles of the cracks are. And then it splits out those pieces and looks at equilibrium and, and looks at all the forces that are acting on them and where there's cracks forming you know, how, how those cracks distributed, what's the effect of tension stiffening, and all this stuff is built into that model, and the idea is that you can, you can model that little square element, and you can use a grillage of those models and a finite element model, and you can actually explicitly model all those effects of deep beam behavior of, of, of the, the effects of these clamping forces that you get near, near a support where these normal forces are clamping the concrete and the cracks together, and you get an improvement in your shear capacity. Um, but of course, it's, it's not particularly useful for, um, for design, necessarily, because it's, um, it's, a, it's a very complicated theory and it needs some computer analysis to solve it. Um, but it's been simplified. Um, if you assume that you're away from these zones where you've got that clamping effect affecting your shears and you focus on your, your Bernoulli regions, then you rearrange some equations and you start to see the familiar arrangement where we have shear capacity built into concrete contributions and steel contributions. And this factor beta on the front, front of the concrete contribution is related to the sliding along those cracks as those crack struts sort of rotate. And you can actually transfer significant shears across those cracks, but it depends on how much those cracks are spaced and, and, a, and the, the, the size of the aggregate that you have. The bigger the beam, the bigger the cracks get and so that leads us to the point of all that, which is the size effect, which is significant for these sorts of regions um, in slender beams. And you can get a massive reduction in your concrete contribution if you leave it unreinforced and you let those cracks grow to however large you want them to. So we have a size effect in our standard. You're technically not required to use it. Um, if you've got a, a beam which is minimally transversely reinforced, um, although the oddity there is that it's a little unclear how the round bar works um, if you're using round bar stirrups, and so we would tend to, to keep that size effect unless we're using um, deformed bar stirrups to make sure that we can actually distribute those cracks. Compare that to the mechanism in the, in the end zones, and whilst a lot of that sort of theory about restraining crack width still applies, the behavior is a little bit different with the, with the spreading out of those struts and the tensile behavior that occurs as those struts spread out, the reinforcing is there to confine that and make sure that we don't get large splits developing right down the middle. And it also helps to make sure that once a network of cracks does form and we have a, a bunch of struts, it does help to stabilize them and keep them all together so that we don't get sort of buckling of those struts and, and get um, premature crushing of the, of the struts because that does, that does happen. So the way we deal with that is that um, the best thing to do is in include a, ideally a two-way grillage of steel, and so that's what deep beam reinforcing is. So deep beams, squat beams, um, this, is, this is really the, the message is that, um, yeah, the most effective thing is to, to help those things perform really well is distributed re reinforcing to at least a minimum content. So jumping back to our case example, most of these beams are actually still slender. There are a few cases where some columns get a little bit close to the, 
um, to the column below. So some of those effects do get picked up, but by and large, it's Bernoulli behavior. Um, it's, it's, they're really just large beams, um, and, and of course, they're large enough to have a significant size effect. Um, but thankfully, we're of a size where it's still practical to, to use deformed bar transverse reinforcing to help keep those cracks nicely distributed. Thought it would be a good idea just to step away from that and have a look at what is a, an actual deep beam and a real example of that. So this is a project of ours in Wellington. It's got a couple of um, limited ductile reinforced concrete shear walls on either end. Um, they are situated on a large foundation beam and there's piles on each end. And so that's absolutely a situation where we're solving that by strut and tie. So very large forces, very large struts. And whilst we have some uh, pretty substantial cord reinforcing and, and transverse reinforcing, um, so cords on the top and bottom of that, of that element. We do have a pretty high ratio of reinforcing in all directions within the midsection of the beam to confine those struts and to make sure that we do stabilize that behavior. So this is a couple of photos from construction on site. This is actually uh, the wall at the other end, and so don't be, worry, these are these are not the, um, the laps for the, for the wall reinforcing in the, in the plastic hinge zone. Um, there's actually another stub which is built up um, from which, which the wall extends from. But it shows, the, it shows the magnitude of the reinforcing involved and it's a little bit hard to see, but um, down within that, um, there is a, effectively a three-way drillage of, of reinforcing in all directions, laid out in a way that it's still practical to drop in bars and build it and tie it all together from the bottom up. So, Having considered slender beams, um, deep beams and strut and tie, um, the other part where strut and tie pr principles are absolutely relevant is it supports. And that doesn't necessarily, this applies to all, all beams, not just, not just large ones. And that's, um, for example, when you've got a, a beam connecting to, into another beam and the need for suspender stirrups to, to tie up that shear force which is landing at the bottom of the girder to make sure that it can actually be introduced into the supporting beam. So we have a couple of cases where we have a transverse transverse beam. So that situation occurs. And we also have this case here, where we have our transfer beams being supported on the portal wall underneath the front face of the tower. And for that one, not only are we dragging up shear force up to the top of that element so that it can be input into the strut and tie model for that element, but we also get some fixity out of that just from the nature, the fact that it is actually tied in. And so you can see we have some pretty significant effectively suspender stirrups in that element as well, anchored right down the bottom um, underneath, underneath the main reinforcing with, a, with an additional coating applied so that we can pick up that strut as well as the joint forces that cross the beam um, with some shear studs there as well. There's a, there's a steel collector element in here too. Um, but the emphasis really is on the importance of that suspender stirrup. So, in conclusion, I suppose, um, most of these beams are slender. They are governed by the, the B region, where we are um, able to use the, the theory around um, plane sections remain plane, VC plus VS, and that actually governs. And because we've done that, we don't actually need to go in and do any work in these D regions. Um, but that's not to say that we don't need to consider the, 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 the local strut and tie behavior it supports to make sure that our load paths are there. So the next part um, of this focuses on um, what turned out to be a relatively interesting part of this, which was the staging factors. So these beams were designed um, to be cont poured continuously in one hit. They needed to be unpropped for pouring the CRL lid because there was enough room, obviously, to stand on the, on the roof of the, of the rail tunnels underneath and uh, support the formwork for the beams themselves. That's no problem. But once that's done, um, that needs to be taken away. The tanking over the, over the, over the rail tunnels needs to be repaired because there is tanking um, for the future case when, when the, um, the development might be taken away and the, and the box is filled up with dirt. Um, however, to remove the propping after the slab was poured, there's just not enough space to do that, and it wouldn't have been possible to, um, 
to, to, to be careful enough with the tanking to make that all work. So we'd first proposed that the beam would be poured full height with a, a construction joint on the side. And that was another thing which was a bit of a hassle and as you'll see later in terms of poor methodologies, it's quite hard to get that all right and tie everything in and achieve the levels that you want. So the builder put forward a proposal to reduce its depth um, for the pour of that level three slab um, down to um, effectively a half beam, so removing uh, 400 mils off the top of a 1200 meter deep beam. And it was also found that it was just a bit, um, there were too many constraints in, in a large project, particularly with the CRL being built under a separate contract, um, to have the constraint where um, they all needed to be built in one um, full pour for the two continuous spans. Um, because the, the northern tunnel was, was progressing ahead of the southern tunnel. And you can see that the first couple of beams, they were poured continuously. Um, however, the next one along, um, that was the point at which the transfer beams and the basement structure started to get ahead of the tunnels. So that started to raise a few alarm bells because the, um, the, the beams, as, as we said, they're, they're a little a little less deep than we would have ideally liked for quite a major transfer element. And we were worried about serviceability deflections, um, so on level three itself, and that's um, not just from the deflections of that weight of that 400 thick slab, um, but also um, the need to allow for an extra three levels, sorry, an extra two levels, three in total, of concrete structure above before we actually got that continuity. And that affects overall deflections, um, and it affects crack widths because we get much higher strains um, because of the positive moments um, in the bottom of that single span um, before we actually get continuity um, to help control the deflections and control the, control the strains. So this relatively busy diagram shows the concerns that we had. Um, we hadn't quantified them, we were just a bit nervous that we weren't necessarily on the safe side of the equation. Um, so the first step is that level three is poured on the half beam. And so relatively that actually deflects quite a lot. 400 mils of concrete is, is probably the weight of at least a couple of levels ordinarily. So a substantial amount of weight on a reduced section. So those deflections are, are actually quite significant. After that full section's cured and the topping's formed a composite connection to the beam, we get a, we get a much stiffer beam, but we still don't have continuity. And then we go and add on levels four and five, and so we get some additional deflection. At that point, the other side of the beam catches up and we pour its half beam. And so we get some continuity there. Um, and then that level three slab is poured. Once that's done, at this point, we have a fully con continuous and composite section. And so we have the remaining self-weight of the buildings as they're constructed. And then of course, after that, we've got whatever additional increment we have to whatever load case we're considering. So service loads or, or our ultimate limit state loads. So the point was that it was important um, in this case to actually consider the, the staging effect and the, each increment of loading um, as it was applied um, to the arrangement as it was at the time. And it can be broken down into three basic stages the pouring of level three, the pouring of level four and five on a deep section, and um, the addition of the remaining loads. This bit here, particularly for these uh, moments, didn't bear out to be uh, particularly, particularly significant. So deflections, we did it the simple way, effective moduli, we're most of the way to the crack section, and long-term deflection by the simple method too. And we did it the hand way. So we know that there are programs out there that can do this sort of stuff for you. Um, I told this to the design engineer once they'd finished. <laughs> and they, um, but of course, how would you know how to drive that if you hadn't been through it at least once? So on the left hand side, um, on the top left, is the, the model or an excerpt uh, from, from one of the basement models, the basement model that we used um, to do these calculations. And it's the full final stage model with everything in it, everything included. And so there's three load cases I've shown, the final case, but also the other two cases, which are actually not right because they're not applied to the right model. So we subtract off that, 
and we add them back on from the models which represent the actual uh, situation at the time that those loads are applied. So a case of simple superposition. And with a relatively simple and, and, and in the scheme of things, you know, relatively determinate case that we have here, not too many other variables, um, then it's possible to, to do this by hand calculation. So originally we had 24 millimeters, um, but if you add in the creep effect, 45. And that's what we get if we allow for that staging effect. And that's too much. However, when you start looking back and working through the potential poor methodologies and the way that the thing will actually build to get around that, then you see that if the instructions given um, to pour this, screed the slab to level when that level three slab's poured, then that deflection that you get when you apply that level three weight um, is effectively built out. So there's a feet deflex, but we don't really care about that because there's plenty of clearance to the, the tunnel. It's not going to fall and sit on that, um, and no one can see it. Um, so apart from the crack wits, which we'll get to later, that's not really an issue at all. And then if the builder decides to carry on, and the concrete example is given on the top, and they keep adding weight, and they keep pouring a flat and level floor, which targets a level, um, which is the way that a concrete structure would normally be built. You'd pour your column, and then you'd position a precast beam to a level, a target level, um, and then you'd pour a slab to a level, of course, checking your depths and things as you go. And by that reckoning, by the time you get to the top, your transfer structure's deflected a heap. The levels above that have deflected less and less, and the top level is perfect. Now, of course, contractors are entitled to, um, to some building tolerance, um, but from a design perspective, that's what you might expect. Compare that to the different situation we have with a steel structure, where we have a column supporting three stories, which is installed in one piece, the base plate set to a level. So any deflection beyond that point if you're pouring to a thickness rather than a level, which is the more common approach generally for a, for a, a steel depth and, and composite beam structure, um, is that you'll end up with a similar deflection on all levels. And this doesn't necessarily need to be the case, it's just a, a bit of an illustration of the, the differences between the two most common approaches to use for, for these two different types of structure. And of course after that you apply your long-term creep increment, which has a similar effect on both. So the solution was um, to provide a pre-camber. So when the topping was poured for the level three slab, which is the transfer level, um, some selected columns were chosen to have a plus 15 preset, just those ones where the deflection was found to be an issue. And that plus 15 target was communicated and applied at all levels above that. So that the precast elements, the column heights, and the floor toppings were all poured to a target level of plus 15 millimeters. And so the theoretical um, deflections, the immediate deflections that result are shown on the right, where the overall deflection is 15 millimeters, so this has gone back down to zero, and we end up with plus 15 on the top. And if we apply that same thing to the steel structure, we preset that base plate by 15, and communicate that the port of thickness is the right approach, you know, with an appropriate awareness of tolerances and how the erection process is going, um, um, you should port a thickness um, rather than level. Um, then theoretically we should end up with a perfect result. So the nice thing about um, this magnitude of adjustment is that we're not too sensitive to if we got the calculation wrong. The feeling was that with such a large T-beam, um, with so much T reinforcing and a little bit of a contribution potentially of the stiffness of the frames as we went up that maybe the calculations were overestimating that deflection a little bit and what would happen if we actually got barely any instantaneous deflection and barely any creep? Well, in this case it shouldn't matter because if there's no deflection then your levels are plus 15, which is fine and if you do get it all occurring then the maximum deflection is, is 20 mils down at the car park level. Um, which again is, is fine and not, um, not unwieldy, certainly a, long, a far cry from the 45 mil that we were confronted with to, at the outset. So this example, th this example I actually worked through on the beam um, on this guy here, which actually uh, was poured, uh, if I've got that grid right, I'm not sure that I have, um, ended up being poured in a continuous segment. 
And so that particular case didn't actually bear out, but there were a couple of other instances. Um, I think this was the one, and these two here, particularly this one where it's actually a single um, continuous, sorry, a, a, a simple span effectively. Um, there is some continuity with the, with the columns, but it's a single span, slightly longer, and a couple of on, c columns on it. So whilst it doesn't have those same, that extra degree of complexity around the, the continuity, it was still um, deflecting um, too much just because of its span. And all the others were fine with no adjustment. And the second part of that is the, is the crack control, um, which is obviously quite important. It's, a, it's an interesting environment in the, in the area between the tunnels and under the lid. Um, it's quite hard to place that in terms of a, a um, in terms of a, a microclimate or a macroclimate, or oh, microclimate, sorry. But 0.3 to 0.4 mils was where we felt most comfortable. So the original design, um, applying the 3101 equations, which is what we use for cutting the crack widths, um, we end up with something which is fairly reasonable. We just used response with the uh, tension turned off just as a convenient way of, of doing a crack section analysis, and you'll see that it, it helps out later, but we didn't need to do that. It's just substituted in for convenience. And uh, we end up with a, a crack width which is within that range. The difficulty is that if we pour that first beam first without the continuity and at the reduced depth, then we end up with quite high strains being locked into the system. And if we actually follow through the calculation, it turned out to be relatively significant. So essentially just a bit more steel, um, both to help reduce the strains um, as well as put a bit of a tighter spacing on the bottom um, on the bottom layer to help to, uh, to, to, to distribute those cracks, um, get them spaced a bit closer, get their, get their widths a bit finer, uh, to get it down to a, to a reasonable level. Um, ULS I won't spend too much time on, but um, similar principles were followed um, in terms of, of, of adding up our, our moments and allowing for the redistribution that occurs as a result of staging. And that's the, uh, that's the end result um, as, they're, as they're tying up those cages. And again, the form bar stirrups, it's um, when the beams get to such a size and the reinforcing gets to such a size where it's, pr where it's practical to do that with the, with the larger bend diameters in the, in the deform bar, it's, it's a, certainly a good idea um, to get the thing performing a lot, whole lot better in shear. And whilst it's not so related to the actual example at hand, the crack issues in that element were predominantly governed by structural loading. Um, the, there are a lot of other elements within this basement where control of thermal and shrinkage cracking is um, the, des the governing criteria. And it's a massively important part of design and it gets all of three lines in our concrete standard. And I think it's, it can be easy to overlook um, there's some fantastic literature out there, though, which goes into the detail. This is, this is one of our favourites. Um, you, you will find this in the references to, um, to, the, to, the, to the commentary, to the concrete standard. Um, it comes out of the UK. It's, a, it's, it's generated by Syria, which is sort of the brands of the UK, in a way, doing research and generating guidance for the building industry. And it's got a fantastic... Um, commentary, and it, it's, it's a fantastic guide because it, it really helps to generate a really good understanding of the principles of all the different types of cracking that can occur from end restraint, from internal restraint, um, from temp temperature differentials. It, it tells you how to, um, how to think about the behaviour and the different types of cracking that you might get in large elements or, or, or thin elements where they've just got a whole lot of restraint. And so um, whilst I'm not going to spend any time today going into detail, I just thought it was it, it would be helpful to, to step to the side and, and go off on a, on a quick tangent um, just to have a look at a couple of the areas where it did govern. So, of course, the rail tunnels being a massive element. Um, then particularly parts of the, of, the, of the walls, for example, where we have the most restraint from the base slab, you'll see closer reinforcing spacing, which is all about controlling those cracks which, which potentially arise um, because of that. And so that really concludes the example for today. Um, relatively simple, sort of at a, focused a lot more at an, at an awareness level, really. Um, having a look at deep beams, the different effects that we're managing, um, load paths, staging considerations, um, 
and, and crack control. And that's it. Take any questions or comments if anyone's happy to. Otherwise, I think um, Charlotte tells me that there might be 15 minutes, 15 minutes away <laughs> potentially, so we've got some time to kill, but that's yeah. all right. Does anybody have any questions? Yeah, Tim. Um, how easy was it for the contractor to form the pre camera, the um, in the that contract bank description? Um, do we have a representative from Fletcher's here? I was, it was threatened that there might be someone show up. Thanks, Cam. <laughs> it's obviously quite a convoluted process here to work out your deflections. So forth. Did you ever consider using pre-stress on the beam to, to try and control that? Um, yeah, so we, well, not, like not, or at least not as far as I'm aware in discussions with the builder. Um, within, within our own practice, we, we did. Um, there are a few reasons that we shied away from it. Um, it's, it introduces a bit of complexity, particularly around the anchorages, especially where we get quite close into the D wall and trying to work in uh, dead ends and things to some quite congested areas. Um, I don't think that's a problem that couldn't have been solved. Um, the post tensioning is, is 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 a really good way to control cracks, um, and and so it was certainly something that was on the table. Um, the other factor was the um, and the decision around using double T's as opposed to a different type of system was was really just around the the need to do it unpropped. And so it really serves um, as a as a temporary forming system as much as as much as a um, as a specific choice to pick that for any other particular reason. Also mm. another question I'm intrigued, why are you using the form bars with turrets? To so the the pictures that I showed um, from the membrane testing, most of which was done with deform bar reinforcing, the key to helping that concrete contribution stick around is keeping those cracks to a size that you can still maintain that aggregate, aggregate interlock. So lots of fine cracks, so you can avoid that slippage that occurs along the cracks as the things rotate. And without deform bar reinforcing, it's a little unclear how well the round bar would actually distribute those cracks and, and avoid larger single cracks occurring. Um, so our view is that, um, well, I mean, this is our, our view. Obviously, the, the, the standard's relatively quiet on it. Um, is that it's, we think it's probably best to maintain that size effect um, if you're using round bar reinforcing. Um, and the deform bar, as soon as we, we get to a size where it's, where it's practical to use, we would absolutely use it to help distribute those cracks. Mm. If we exceed the design criteria, or do you mean from a monitoring point of view? So if we, uh, yeah, so if we, I mean, we, that was part of the reason why we went and loaded up the beams with a bit more steel is because we did exceed them by design. And um, so absolutely we needed to, to control those. I mean, there's, a, there's an enormous amount of scatter around that science. Um, the methods in 3101 aren't the only methods out there. They're relatively good. Um, there's a bunch of provisions around them in terms of spacing of reinforcing and, and skin reinforcing up the sides of beams and things which help to provide um, some, some added protection to keep you on the right side of things. Um, and so, I mean, what they say is that you should expect cracks which are, are lesser in width. Um, but there's other things such as the, I mean, the, the best thing to control cracks is lots of small diameter bars to get maximum efficiency from bond. And so, you know, how well do you expect those equations to perform if you've got 40 diameter bars at the bottom of a beam, even if they are at quite a close spacing? Um, so, yeah, I, I think the answer to your question is, um, yes, we absolutely did go back and, and revisit the design to get those crack widths down. Oh, sorry, if, if, they were, if they were exceeded, would we crack inject them? Is, was that the question? Yeah, um, yes. So, um, we, perhaps to answer that with an example, we, we have done some work on a project in Wellington, an existing building that we were doing some strengthening to. It's a tall frame building, and there was a point load from a girder about D out from the support and a single quite large crack um, had consistently occurred on all levels up the height of that frame um, to the point that it was pretty clear that there was no shear contribution left. Um, and despite um, part of the strengthening work actually dealing with the location of that point load from a seismic point of view um, and relocating that, um, we absolutely did inject that crack to try and restore what 
we could of the concrete contribution, so we, you don't start from a point of an already degraded string. Yeah, so the vibrations, the, the main input in that area is the, is the trains, and absolutely that's a massive issue. That's, that was a bit beyond sort of our, um, what we were comfortable dealing with um, just from our gut. We've, we've dealt with some other buildings above um, train stations before. Um, we got some external consultants to help out with that. Um, they were the ones that came up with the recommendations around the separation and the... And the not quite there yet in terms of the construction phase. It's not quite ready at that point. It's still, um, they're still finishing off the buildings. Um, but I, I guess the, the only way to truly test it will be to, to run some trains up and that's why it's so important to, um, to get whatever good advice, um, external advice from people that deal with this sort of stuff um, all the time to, to try and make sure that you're on the right side of it. In terms of um, other sources, um, you know, the, the, the common one footfall, the mass of the whole system is, is far too much. Um, for that to be of any concern for a transfer structure. Um, and in terms of the vertical period, um, well, and, and as far as that might affect the seismic demands, um, that's pretty important, um, but it ends up being quite a short period. Oh, in terms of constructability? Oh, I don't think there are any specific issues. Oh, it's, oh, sorry, compaction. Oh, that's a completely different question. Um, <laughs> sorry, no, 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 no. It's, it's just my interpretation of it was completely different. Yeah, yeah the, 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 first, the first couple that we did, we had, we had a slightly different stirrup arrangement. Um, so we had a lot more, and it was um, particularly to deal with some of the changes around construction joint and the need to in introduce some extra ones because the, the section's only part height and um, the need to have a, another stirrup in there to deal with, with that section as well as the ones which go full height. It was pretty congested, um, and we changed tack and went to some bigger, more uh, stirrups, which were spaced further apart, so there was plenty of space to get to get vibrators in. And as far as I'm aware, there were there were no real issues on on the transfer beams. That um, yeah, so there were some areas and um, other parts of the job where we had some pretty heavy congestion, and and there were some compaction issues there. But but these ones, um, there. They're not particularly congested. The, the reinforcing content, whilst they're big bars, is, is actually, you know, about average. Um, and so there was plenty of space for the concrete to flow. Haven't got the answer on that. Sorry. No. Be interesting. I expect there'll be a lot less than we calculate, especially at this stage. Uh, no, um, in the construction monitoring, I think that's all gone reasonably well. Um, I'm sure there are probably a, a few areas picked up here and there, um, but I don't think that's been a major. No, making sure that's nicely roughened. Thanks for your attention. All right. Um, can you all just join me again to thank Andy for his presentation?